Okay guys, I think we're going to get started. Thank you so much for coming. This is our final green bag of the semester, so we're really excited to be here talking about such a great topic. Um, just a couple of uh, things that I wanted to announce at the beginning here is <clears throat> all of your food, your plates, your cutlery, your napkins, all of that is compostable. So when you're about to leave, make sure you put them in the um, blue bin with the green bag right there so we can make sure that all gets composted at the end of the event. Um, anything else that you brought in, so your own coffee cups or your own water bottles, please hold them to the side so that way we make sure we don't have any contamination. Um, another announcement I want to make is that we are currently looking for applicants for the summer and fall semesters. So the deadline for that is Friday, April 10th at 5 p.m. So if anyone who is interested in applying um, to be an intern with our office, um, I have flyers in the back and the information is also on our website. Um, and then my last final plug before we get started is uh, Sustainability Week is April, starting April 6th through April 11th this year. And our keynote speaker will be Dr. Raj Patel, and that is on Wednesday, April 8th, 5.30 p.m. in Satili Theater. Um, so if you have any questions about that, come find me, or we have that all on our website as well. Um, that being said, I want to introduce our garden coordinator, Katie Kerbel, and we'll get the event started. So thank you. Hi. Um, like Ashton said, my name is Katie Kerbel, and I'm the garden coordinator for the Office of Sustainability. Um, as an arts management major and an environmental studies minor, I've tried to combine my passions for art, music, and the environment through my coursework and now through my internship. When I found out that ecomusicology was a field, I finally felt like these seemingly uncomplimentary disciplines I had been studying actually had a home base. There were musicians, activists, environmentalists, artists, scholars, and other people who identified with the same passions I had, and there is even a term to coin it all. When I attended an ecomusicology's conference in Asheville, I was inspired by the tight-knit community, as well as excited to be part of this newly developed conversation. That is why I'm thrilled that this topic has made its way to CFC, both at this event and at our upcoming kickoff of concert and art walk for Sustainability Week, happening on April 6th at Stern Gardens from 5 to 7 p.m. Shameless plug, we are also seeking visual and um, literary art submissions for this event with the themes of engagement, sustainability, and social justice, if any of you are interested. It is an honor that CFC's introduction to the field of ecomusicology will be experienced through the knowledge and performance of Dr. Mark Peddelty, who visits the campus from the University of Minnesota. A musician, author, and professor of anthropology and mass communication, Dr. Peddelty has done research on the role that music plays in the environmental movement. His book, Ecomusicology, Rock, Folk, and the Environment, explores the political ecology of popular music and its implications for sustainability. It is here that Dr. Peddelty raises the question, can musicians really make the world more sustainable? Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mark Peddelty. Thank you all, I really appreciate the invite uh, from Ashlyn, um, Craig, Katie, Brian, and Abby, everybody that's been involved. It's been wonderful so far in the uh, time I've been here. Um, what I want to talk to, to you about today is what is ecomusicology, and that's really one of the first things Ashlyn and Abby approached me with, wanting to know um, what this is, and what can music do to foster stewardship? I want to go to that more specific question. Um, and then finally, discussion, because ultimately, as you'll see, is w those of us that have been studying and doing research in this area have been raising more questions than we've been answering, and those answers tend to come from audiences and musicians. So this will all lead to the question, how does music connect you to place? That's one of the questions I'm going to want to ask, and maybe to seed that question now to think about some of the ways you're connected to place um, through music or, for that matter, the arts in general. So what is ecomusicology? Well, the first thing I would want to say is it's a word that I decided sounded good to use for the title of a book. And um, that happened to coincide with several musicologists and ethnomusicologists that were starting to use the word to define a field of discussion. And the question always has to be raised when, as academics and scholars, we come up with a new word, is does that really do anything? And I think the jury is still a little bit out on this, although we're starting to see it's nice to have a word to use for this. I don't want to go into great depth inside baseball to talk about how sound studies or bioacoustics and other areas of study have dealt with music and the environment before and how this differs. But I do want to say this. 
One of the things that I think led to us talking about this in terms of ecomusicology, and a guy by the name of Alexander Redding first suggested this, was that the, those other areas weren't really thinking in terms of ecological understanding. They weren't really thinking in terms of environmentalism. That is not, that is to say, things that, that came out of the 60s and an interest in doing something about environmental crises and connecting our disciplines to that. So questions like biodiversity, the idea that we want to have more biodiverse ecosystems, environmental health, ideal of toxins, pollution, etc. These things have not been really considered by musicologists, ethnomusicologists, and others that study music. Whereas musicians have been interested in these things for quite a while, and so there was a disconnect there. And then finally, environmental justice. The idea that the costs and benefits of environmental action should not unduly fall on or privileges should not go to just certain, one certain group, caste, or class. And then, of course, we often use the word sustainability to describe these things. I think that's what gave rise to echomusicology as a conversation and as a developing, we might call it a field, we might call it a conversation. More and more to our surprise, I think it is probably legitimate to call it a field, but we don't want it to become something separate from the main disciplines, ethnomusicology, musicology, popular music studies. So some of the key figures, and I'm going to go by this very quickly, but just so that you have some references for those of you that are, more, that are interested. Denise von Glenn. Um, she's a very interesting figure in that she wrote a book about composers and the environment and realized after she got done doing that that she had not covered any women. And then she came up with this book, women in the, uh, Music and the Skillful Listener, that's all about women composers that she and others have ignored. That in the environment we often think about the big and the sublime, the sort of John Muir National Park image. And that she was doing the same thing by looking at, at Alexander Grofe, uh, sorry, Ferde Grofe and other um, classical composers who were also looking at the big, the pastoral, and the sublime. When in fact, a lot of women composers have dealt more with domestic context, local areas, some of the things that are key to sustainability. And her book, women, uh, Music and the Skillful Listeners, is strongly recommended. Erin Allen, who's at University of North Carolina Greensboro and is their director of sustainability studies. He is somebody that studies, um, well, Beethoven on one hand, but he also deals with questions of instrument manufacture. The ways in which, for example, the Pernambuco tree in Brazil has become endangered because it's used and preferred for violin bows. And so he looks at the ec ecology of, of instrument manufacture. And finally, Jeff Titan, who's been a ma major figure in ethnomusicology for years, who's emeritus at Brown, who does work on Thoreau, music, sound, and the way in which sound and music ties us to place. And he particularly looks at uh, bluegrass and popular music. So those are just name a few people that have been part of this conversation. There have been quite a few. The latest Ecomusicology Echo Conference, the third one in Nashville, brought in over 200 people to discuss these issues, musicians and scholars. So let's get to one of these questions. What can music do? I have to admit I've been sort of a retrograde functionalist in all this. Thinking about something that's as, usually dealt with as aesthetic, meaningful, and instead looking at it, what does it do? Looking at it is in ecological terms. And I'll draw on here um, Jake, Jacobson and Al, who argue that participating in an art event, and they talk about music very much in this, can stimulate changes in pro-environmental behavior. But one of the questions I, I really ask is how does that happen? And of course, we're never going to get at any kind of linear music is played, person does this, is persuaded, and, and changes something in the environment. But short of that, one of the ways that I think is useful to look at this is what I call semiotic ecology. The way in which it's not only um, it's not only interesting to think about how the arts, music, and culture connect us to place. It's absolutely essential. And I'm going to try to make that argument here using the example that somebody brought up earlier, the lawn. Um, uh, Ashlyn was in this very room listening to Paul Robbins talk about the lawn as an idea. And I'll use the same example. So semiotic ecology. I first want to say a little bit for the students here, what is semiotics? And semiotics is simply the study of signs, or the way in which the whole world is constructed for us, or it wouldn't make sense as a human animal. And therefore, hopefully, we can work with those articulations between meaning and material to change things. 
So for example, the rose. I think the association most people draw with the rose would be love and romance. Well, that's an interesting thing to think about, that material thing we call the rose and romance, and to think about how in the Western world even, in the medieval world and before, the rose was associated with the blood of Christ and sacrifice, and therefore would have meant anything but that. So right there we see that very simple thing that the material and the meaning are detached for the human animal. And therefore our world is constructed, our realities are constructed of meanings. So put that to the nth and think about the way in which our realities, our material reality, our ecological reality is culturally constructed. Now I want to give you a very specific example then that relates to questions of ecology. Imagine the law. So impacts of material ecology. Somebody tell me what you associate the lawn with. The middle class Kentucky bluegrass lawn. What are some of the associations you give to that? Moral, cultural, or et cetera? Success. Success, excellent, yeah, absolutely. One is successful if they can have that, that lawn. So once, once upon a time, only aristocrats had a man. Family. Family, okay, yeah. This, comfortable ideas of family, and you can play on it too. I mean, there's, the, there's a sort of practical element there too, yeah. What else, yeah? Chores. Chores, okay. Remembering that this is something you do. And I think maybe not only is that that, that many of us probably think back to that as work, but we also think back to that as sort of how we gain enculturated to become a certain type of middle class citizen that does certain things. I think we, oh, please. Safety. What do you mean by that? That's interesting. Like there aren't like any other like you're not afraid. Like it's not like the woods. You're like protected. It's a sort of domesticated space. That's an excellent point. You know, and I think this is all practical. So, for example, the practical use I would use of it as as somebody that works with a group called Metro Blooms that puts in rain gardens is how do we know what people associate with the lawn so that if we're trying to convince them to do something a little bit different with at least part of that, how do we speak to them and have a discussion that's meaningful, that has a real serious material impact? So for example, some people uh, refer to Kentucky bluegrass lawns as green concrete because 80% of the water that falls on it immediately flushes right out of the system, taking with it detritus, toxins, whatever you have. And this can cause huge problems, and in fact, it does. Um, for, for example, I'm from Minnesota. Our detritus that we flush down the Mississippi River, and we have very clean waters ourselves, go all the way down to the delta and create this thing called the dead zone. Because all of that flushing in there is causing algae blooms, which then die and create a condition known as hypoxia, where nothing can live. This gets the size of Texas every year at different times, and it fluctuates but it's usually during the spring that it really, really happens in a really bad way. And that kind of all starts with an idea of what a lawn is supposed to be, what agriculture is supposed to be. And therefore, if you do something like um, work with people to put in rain gardens, depressions where it's able, the, the water's able to percolate, you have to think about what is it that they associate that with. And we've had a kind of a nice transition in the Twin Cities over the last 15 years, where it's gone from people saying, you're gonna put that in my yard, it's gonna decrease property values, to where it's a little bit of the sort of middle class keep up with the Joneses idea, where everybody thinks they kind of need one of these. Native landscaping, rain gardens, etc. So, but the key there, I think, is culture. And one of the key things to <coughs> culture, I believe, is music. I think since the beginning of music, it's been tightly connected, ritually and otherwise, to the way in which we deal with the environment. And so I want to give some examples of that. But the first example is going to be one of two songs that we're going to perform today. And I say we because it's not going to be just, just me. And the first song is Woody Guthrie's This Land. And just one thing to know about this song before we all sing it is uh, where it came from. Woody Guthrie, in the early 1940s, is in the back seat of a car and he hears God Bless America and he hates the song. He does not like Irving Berlin's song because he considers it too nationalistic, jingoistic, and he feels like all the different gains and pains that had taken place during the Depression for the working class and for farmers and others was sort of um, being ignored in that movement towards a certain type of nationalist patriotism. And so he created the song, This Land is Your Land. And I want us to think about both what Guthrie was intending with the song as we sing it, 
but also how that song has been played out, or for that matter, God Bless America, in different contexts that connect us or disconnect us in different ways to land. So I'm going to be helped here a little bit, and one of the re this is one of the reasons I, I think it's always good to sing a few songs as amateurs singing together. And that is because you don't really, I think, understand music or song if you don't get to, at some point, um, participate in it. And I usually do this with a band. Um, uh, so for example, these, these old guys here, um, those are the, the band, it's ma mainly a bunch of faculty, but we have a lot of students come in and out of the, the band, Hypoxic Punks. Um, but in this context, I like to, to uh, still be able to bring the music here a little bit uh, as an amateur. And I was, somebody was very kind to me yesterday. I found out that one of the uh, organizers of the event is a singer and a music minor. And her name is Abby. And so as of four o'clock, as of four o'clock yesterday, I said, oh gee, would you mind singing these verses? Because usually Sarah and the band sings this, and I don't even know the, the verses. So, um, so I think she's, I, I've already heard it, she does really well. Um, so uh, we'll all sing, I'll play one on the harmonica to get us in the right key. Then we'll all sing the chorus. So everybody sing the chorus. Now some people don't feel comfortable singing the chorus. It's kind of like in church. Some people don't feel comfortable. That's just fine. Um, so then we'll hear verse one, then we'll sing the chorus, verse two, the chorus. We'll skip verse three, but you can, I think you can probably read that up there. And so we'd like you to all participate. And then of course, we'll listen very closely to Abby on the verses. Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll step out of the way so you can have the mic. I think you probably want to so they can hear you. I'm not a um, mic person. <laughs> okay. oh, oh, really? Oh, cool? would you rather just belt it out? I don't know if belt's the word, but yeah. Okay, all right. Okay. I'm a mic person. All right. All right, okay. Is this land made? 
Well, let me just ask you this question. Uh, what do you think Guthrie was trying to do in terms of, of thinking about people, place, country, land? What do you think he was trying to do with this song, based on these verses? Keep the fences down. Yeah, I, I think so, absolutely. Any other thoughts on that? How else would you describe what you think he was doing? Empowering people. I guess I think in verse 5 he's kind of um, making an argument that why aren't you using the land to feed yourself, sort of. So I think it's sort of empowering people to go and use what they are supposed to use. Yeah, absolutely. So coming out of the dust ball, bowl, thinking about people that have been disempowered, how could they kind of take back a sense of what the country is, the nation, and the land? I think this is all very, very true. Um, and so I think one of the things we see here, and actually I want to quickly ask this other question because I think it's really interesting. This song, once any song leaves a composer's pen or their, the mouth of the performer, it becomes everybody's song. In your own experience, what is the song meant in terms of how it's used institutionally, in terms of land, whatever? How, what's been your own experience of singing this song? The smoky fire commercial about the bear that <laughs> oh, used that song all the time. Oh, yeah, yeah. Or a Jeep commercial for the Super Bowl, if anybody saw that, which actually raised some controversy because people, some people on the right, nationalistically, didn't like the fact that global <laughs> images were used. And then some people on the left don't like the fact that a company like Jeep is using this song and, as usual, dropping out those last three critical verses. Um, anybody else? Any other experiences? Yeah. I think the first place that I recognized it was uh, in that Jib Jab video of Carrie and Bush where they used Yeah. And they were sued. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they were sued for using This Land is Your Land because Nora, who's a wonderful person, uh, his children essentially had sold the rights to Ludlow a Music Company, which sued people for using this song that belongs to you and I. Um, Kembrill McLeod wrote a, wrote a book um, on copyright that I really recommend, the very first chapters on that sort of ironic dilemma around that song. So one of the things that I think really where we see a movement towards musicians and popular music and, and including the folk world, um, really thinking about environmentalist values was Pete Seeger. And as David Ingram points out in this article, it was very controversial at that, that time. For much of the same reasons we talked about jib jab there. The old left didn't like the fact that Pete Seeger was seen to be leaving them to talk about environment versus labor. The new left didn't like that it was done in the idiom of folk, which, which um, they felt was sort of outdated and no longer spoke to the people. But Pete Seeger is now, I think, generally seen as somebody that was willing to say, I'm going to make some music that's going to try to matter. And now how did he try to make it matter? Well, one, he did it through lyrical denotation. That is, he was talking about environmental issues in the song. But I'm not sure that was the most important part of what he did. Um, performance context was extremely key here. He performed semiotics where you articulate a meaning to an object or a signifier. He was articulating the, that music very directly and purposefully to an environmental movement that would, where it would have some impact and meaning in a certain way. Now, so the question I've been asking in my own way is, can music assist stewardship? And so seeing it as sort of a research question in the traditional social science sense, but also as a challenge in the more action research sense. You know, doctor save thyself sort of thing. Can you do something as amateur musicians to try to make a difference in a hyper-local context around environment? And that's sort of the question that I've been dealing with lately. After publishing uh, the book that was referred to, Echo Musicology, where I was raising a lot of questions, but not coming up with many answers. Most of the answers I've found since come from musicians themselves that are doing creative stuff. And they come from the past as well, in terms of ethnomusicologists that are studying all the many peoples around the world who have been using music to do things in terms of sustainability for eons. So for example, Stephen Feld's work um, in New Guinea Papua New Guinea, looking at folks that have been using music for a long time to think about how they interact with the environment in a way that represents greater biodiversity, environmental health, and environmental justice. So one of the ways I've been doing this is to learn from professionals. And although I'm based in Minneapolis, I spend my summers in um, what's often referred to as the Salish Sea area, 
of Washington and British Columbia. You might know it more as Puget Sound, Strait of Juan de Fuca, uh, Fuca and the Strait, uh, the Strait of Georgia. More and more people are adopting indigenous terms to that area, the Salish Sea. Um, uh, in fact, it's not just indigenous folks that are doing that now. For the most part, you talk to anybody there, they know what the Salish Sea is and are referring to it as a single body of water. Ge geographically and otherwise makes more sense. So one of the things I've done is go around to various musicians there that are fairly well known for doing this, including one that I'm going to mention in a second, Dana Lyons, that was just here. When was Dana here? Last year. Last year, okay, great, yeah. So Dana's a good friend. I want to study him because he's somebody that I think is fairly distinct in how successful he's been in using music for environmental purposes. So I want to start with his example, a couple cases from Washington and um, British Columbia. I forgot to hit my timer. I don't want to go over here. Does somebody have the... It's 12.35. Okay, excellent. Well, I'm going to actually then send you to this. I'm going to just tell you a little bit about Dana Lyons so we can get into the very last example. Dana's based in Bellingham, Washington. And the first thing he did when he um, graduated from Swarthmore back in the 80s was get on I-90 and create a little tour with his brother to advertise the fact that the Department of Energy was trying to use the Hanford Reach in Washington as a commercial nuclear dump site. Now it's already the largest Superfund site in the entire United States just from defense materials. Can you imagine if that would have succeeded? And he brought attention to it by having a musical tour along the way, including in the winter, where he'd kind of jokingly say to people, I know you never have accidents around here, no problem, right? And those folks didn't even know that that, that, that uh, proposition was out there. Now, I'm not saying Dana single-handedly stopped that proposition, but I think his music and that tour were a good example of what musicians can do to support a movement like that. And he's been doing that ever since, including, and this is what I want to send you to, a um, song called Cows With Guns. If you go to YouTube and put in Cows With Guns, you'll see these videos that have over 3 million hits that a German animator created for him. He doesn't even know the guy. Um, that is a brilliant song in the sense that conservative ranchers and rodeo folk love it, love to use it, and so do vegan associations. So you can imagine a song that kind of, kind of plays what you might call polysemy, plays in different ways to different people, to be able to speak to different audiences. And that's one of the keys, I think, of what he does too. He uses music to bring different audiences together around issues, like currently his coal tours trying to stop the development of coal ports along the west coast that would ship coal to China from eastern Montana, increasing 20 20 mile long trains per day that drop 2% of their coal along the route in that whole route. And he created another tour around that. So that was one of the cases, one of the people I've been learning from. I'm going to briefly mention some of the other. Bob's and Lolo, um, environmentalist musicians who got to start the Stanley Park Aquarium, who teach children through music. The Raging Grannies. Um, they're not as well known on this coast, but they're actually a fairly big deal on the west coast. In Victoria, um, uh, British Columbia, a group of 12 women created their own group called the Raging Grannies. And it was because um, they found that they were not being listened to by policymakers in 1987 because they were opposing nuclear warships, mainly from the U.S., coming into their port. But they were also not being listened to by environmentalists. And it was because they were older women. So what they did is go down to the Salvation Army, grabbed a bunch of old clothes, and created the Raging Grannies. And what they do is take standard songs, sing them, and everybody else sings along. They're kind of a musical headline service. And they've been extremely effective because nobody knows from Ottawa on over to Vancouver what to do with these women. And so these gaggles have spread around the world. There's gaggles all over Australia, Israel, multiple places. And the gaggles in, in Seattle and San Francisco are extremely large. They keep theirs down to 12. Sitting around with those women, the average age of 85 at that table, hearing from them, I don't think I've ever been in a room full of more um, seasoned, intelligent, um, insightful activists in my life. Um, it was just a real privilege. And then there was a couple other cases. I'm going to kind of move on. But the last one is Idle No More, an indigenous-led movement in Canada where they're using music very differently in the past, and it reflects a different nature of that coalition. And I, I don't want to go into too much detail. I put out this manuscript, Indiana University Press, Music Nature Play Series. If you're interested in the topic, you can read more. 
But to say this, I was learning from professionals, people that really use music in ways that I think are extremely innovative that we can all learn from, answering questions. Another place I've done is learning from students, um, including students that have gone on in professions like park rangers that have come back into the class and talk about how to use music and the arts in their work. Learning from a community, ethnographically performing in local context and learning what works doesn't work. And I would say one of the things I keep coming back to is the Pete Seeger idea that you articulate it with people that are doing the activism directly. So with Metro Blooms, for example, when we have these benefit concerts, there's that connection. All right. Well, I want to play one song before I get to the punchline and just offer some of the ways of what I think music can do in relation to the environment and before I get to your ideas. But I want to play this one song because it's one that I often find myself forgetting, and students and musicians and others remind me of, that one of the main things in music is to express your own connection to land, whatever you're trying to say. And in this case, this song, I think, is somewhat of a rep representation of what E.O. Wilson, the biologist, calls biophilia. He, he believes that we all, intrinsically as human beings, have some connection to land, other animals, and to, to life. And that that's one of the things that, despite some overwhelming odds sometimes, keeps us going and why there's some truth value in what we represent, what we present, what we perform. And this song is not one that I, I uh, typically play solo. It's also not a song I typically use in an academic context because I'm not sure it represents well what music can do. But I think to a certain extent it represents, in a personal way for us, what music, what music is. And I, there's another thing I don't do. I typically don't explain what a song's about. Because typically I'm playing with a band and we're in a club and we play this as a rock song and probably nobody has any clue what it's about. You know, they dance around or whatever. But I just want to mention it to you because, it, to, because this idea of how music connects us. Um, I grew up, my father owned a stockyards. That's where you take the cattle, you sell them, and, and they go out to McDonald's or wherever. He owned a small stockyard. So from the age of seven, I was chasing cattle from the trucks to the, to the scale, to the ring, to their holding pens, and back. And so there's a line in the song where I say my cows turn in circles, that for some reason out of those hundreds of thousands of cattle I saw, this one that had an inner ear disease that would go in circles, for me, it's just struck as a metaphor or re remained with me. And it was both sort of sad when you think about why are we selling this, this cow that goes in circles, but also we'd have to open up a gate here to get it going here to hit its head, and then we'd open a gate over here to go around. And for some reason, that found, I found that for me to be the perfect, um, the perfect metaphor for what's become of agribusiness, the sort of Rube Goldberg machine where you grow a whole bunch of crops for fructose corn syrup or whatever, it makes you a lot of money, including my family. I mean, we have a little farm that actually is now doing pretty well because of all these subsidies and everything for ethanol and, and fructose corn syrup. But idealizing that idea of the family farm when in fact, what is that really doing? And particularly this song came from something my father said. Before my father died, he said, we didn't farm the land, we mined it. And I thought that was a really powerful thing for a conservative Republican farmer to say, who was realizing that all the stuff we had done with farming, of course it's not all bad, but there was an element which we weren't really thinking about what it was doing. And that's what this song is about. Um, and so I just want to play it for you to finish up before I kind of give the punchline here. of you in the dead Whatever it was I think I forget My cows are in circle My chickens got food Pigs gotta eat So what you gonna do? Send the bodies to the bone yard 
doctor right away. Hey. up here here's what I have and, and frankly it's a little bit banal because I think these are things we kind of all know but we want to explore in different ways and one of the best ways to explore them I think is music loop. so approximately in, in terms of what can local music do I would say it increases the sense of the people involved that something matters in a way that without music or without the arts we often don't get to and that's the key that's the thing that I think I've, I've discovered more than anything else in our concerts and other, other places Assist organizers, so a group like Metro Blooms, it assists them somewhat in organizing people. One of the things that, that psychologists refer to with music is entrainment, the way in which it gets people all on the same page and we can respond to different uh, rhythmic, uh, I, I, don't, I don't want to go into what entrainment is, but basically it's the idea that the human animal is the only one that can respond to a rhythmic um, uh, cue and give it back. And that's really important, something about our, our communication. Provide a bit of funding, recruit a few volunteers. Going down the list now, there's a huge drop off. I don't believe music tends to inform. So when Billy Bragg writes songs and uh, mixing pop and politics, I wonder what the point is. He's not kidding. Most musicians don't really feel that music does much to inform. Advocate, maybe, but probably not persuade. You know, we generally preach to the choir with music. But ultimately, as a small part of a large network that installs rain guards, therefore assists stewardship. For greater biodiversity, environmental health, and better health, uh, better, um, stronger, more beautiful communities, I really kind of do feel that it matters. And that has been one of the underlying subtexts of all this. Does music matter beyond the aesthetics and the feel of it? Can it do other things? And I think yes. And to feed back on it, I think increasingly audiences are drawing interpretations and genre associations based on whether or not music does that. So when we get some critiques of U2 fans of what U2 is doing in terms of their touring, I think that's entering back into their aesthetic and, and fan judgments. All right, so that's where I'm gonna leave it here. The music and musicians perform a small yet important role in environmental movements. And I believe we can do more with local music to connect people to local plays. 
But what I'd like to do for the remainder of the time, and I hope there is some remaining time, is to hear your thoughts, your questions, your examples, your ideas of what music can do, how music connects people to place, or how it could. Thank you very much. So any questions or experiences or thoughts about that? That's a good point. And you might even say, I think, if, we, if our music doesn't ever do that, why not? You know, what is the, the sort of block of why we're not supposed to do that in music? Why is it so rare? In popular music, where we talk about human rights and so many other things, or at least, you know, have, why is it that environment so often kind of precluded from that? Well, I lived in Hawaii for six years, and Brother Is, who sings, I'm sure everybody in here has heard much of his music he plays a uh, ukulele and he, most of what he talks about in his music is the aina which is the land and the hawaiians want the land back and in the music you can feel the the you know the sadness of it but also the aloha and the love of it so whenever you hear his music you're drawn immediately to that feeling of the land and the water and and what is Hawaiian? Mm -hmm. This is a really good point, much like a spiritual. I mean, you can tell somebody something's wrong, but a spiritual communicates that in a way that I think um, words don't. Yeah. Any other experience? Yes, please. I think music in general just kind of helps people get involved. Uh, like, for instance, if you would have just given a speech without having a couple of songs in the book, I probably my interest wouldn't have been. Uh, as it was. That's very kind of you, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Can you get that on camera for the band? Yeah. Um, I, thought it was, I thought it was just really cool to, uh, I think it makes people more comfortable and it makes people, uh, or it bonds people together because music is kind of something we all have in common. I don't think I've really ever met somebody who doesn't enjoy music. So, it's a good thing. It's a good point. Yeah. I, would, I would love to have somebody among the student audience here disabuse me of this sense that um, 30 years ago there was a stronger um, leadership of musicians in issues of social justice and environmental awareness. Uh, people like Joe Baez and Bob Dylan, Woody Guthrie, longer than 30 years ago. So who are the bands that you guys listen to these days who are uh, making statements about Elk? I'm, I'm and we, we can write them down. So that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Going off, going off that point, I think it's um, it's less of, nowadays. It's more about you know that pop culture type of thing, where bands are just trying to get in the limelight. Um, I, I do think there are bands out there that have those same ideals uh, that you were talking about, but it's definitely to a lesser extent now than it was like back in the '70s or the '80s. Yeah, and that might maybe that was the unusual time. I don't know. We had one in the back, and then right here. chance it sounds fascinating what could you email me that I don't know I don't know Polish ambassador okay. yeah do, do people know the band cloud cult 
Um, they're out of Minnesota, and they, they do some of the some of that similar work as well. And I wonder if at some point some of these these that are not as famous as a well Jack Johnson was famous and did this, but um, are, will become more well known at some point. Um, you had. I was just going to say, arguably, what Dan was saying is the same group of people. I mean, we're still listening to Bob Dylan and Joe Baez and getting those same messages. And um, I don't know if that's a result of maybe social media having, it's a little bit harder to find some of those communal niches for things that you really care about because it's so widespread all the time and it's really easy to get on that limelight train and you find the bands that are really big and in your face and not necessarily the ones that are smaller and more localized. But I think they're out there. They're maybe just harder to, to find and that we still have these, we carry a torch some of those original folk singers and they still have a huge impact. Yeah, that's a good point. To, to, to a certain extent, it was what it means to be local changed with digital communications so that local is more connected localities and a little bit less this place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so maybe those that follow like Polish ambassador or whatever kind of connected that way. Other, um, any other thoughts? I just know this, sorry. Uh, Please. Oh, um, this other band, Papadocio, does the, kind of the same thing as Polish Ambassador does. Um, they play like a video right after they finish or like right before. I'm pretty sure it's about industrial ag too, um, just to like get that message out. And I don't think their songs are necessarily about it, but it is cool if they attach that to their performance. Yeah. And I think there's probably something to that. There's not many that are going to do a bunch of denotative topical songs about the environment. I mean, who's going to listen to that? But maybe to have one here and how they use it, that kind of thing. I mean, even Dana Lyons, not all the music about environment. We had one other thought over here. I think somebody was, oh, please. Yeah. Um, this, um, this doesn't necessarily have to do with um, environmental movement or activism, but I think that there's definitely um, musicians and bands who are connected to their own place, like Detroit comes to mind, or Cleveland, or Pittsburgh, of, of these cities that are struggling to um, make their presence known again. And Well, really great. I'd love to talk to all of you. So email me, talk to me. I really enjoyed hearing from you. So thank you very much for having me.